Hello and welcome to Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm Teresa Alt. I'm here today with David Foote. We are both activists in the local chapter, Ithaca Democratic Socialists of America. And I think David wants to say a few words about what it's all about. Sure. So, Teresa, we've worked on this show together for several years, um, looking at specific examples, case studies, issues, and, and different both theory and practice around this idea of, of democratic socialism and the work of the Democratic Socialists of America. So periodically, we want to just take a step back and say, maybe you've been listening for a while, maybe this is the first show that you've come across, but what is democratic socialism? So according to the DSA website, dsausa.org, you can check that out. Um, democratic socialists believe that working people should run both the economy and society democratically to meet human needs, not to make profits for a few. So that last clause there about making profits for a few, um, there's a lot of, th this is the thing that's standing in the way of a lot of us here in the United States um, living with. That some aspects. Capitalism. Capitalism, yes. Um, so many of our lives are structured around making money in one form or another, and not even really for us. Our workplaces where we spend most of our time are privately owned, and they're run in order to make a profit. That profit motive then bleeds out and becomes a part of a lot of the decisions that we make, a lot of the ways that we choose to act. The more value is assigned to things, the more we need them. Um, so that becomes really destructive when the most important things in our lives are also the most expensive. Things like where we live, the amount of education that we're able to access, um, life-saving medicine, nutritious food. If you don't have money, you just can't access a lot of these things. You can't even maybe reliably get around. So democratic socialists look at this and see what could be possible if we made decisions together in real radical democratic ways and plan how to meet everyone's needs, not just shift wealth upward for the 1%. Things don't have to be as unfair as they are. Uh, we would like to see public ownership of things like electricity, water, and internet access as utilities that everyone needs, as well as things like free healthcare, schools, and other infrastructure. Um, these things are central to a democratic socialist project. We'd also like to see, parallel to this, limitations on the ability of individuals to hoard wealth or private property, and how much of our lives are spent working. Things like paid parental leave, longer vacations, and regulation against expecting people to work when they're not even on the clock, like check emails outside of your work hours, respond to texts from your boss, um, so that more people have freedom and access to the things that make life worth living. Yes, that classical eight-hour day Eight hours to work, eight hours to rest, eight hours for what we will. And with automation having, having even shortened people's need to work during a work day, there's even now an opportunity to make that less. And I've seen people say maybe a four-hour work week or a 32-hour work week. Um, maybe that's something on the horizon. So the whole project of democratic socialists, in the absence of the kind of democracy that would make all of these easy to implement, is to organize alongside of others um, to create these systems that would make life more fair and equitable, to stand with our friends and neighbors and build the kind of power together that could improve our lives. This can happen most effectively, some have argued, I think I agree with this, in workplaces, which because they're the sites where profit is created and wealth is driven upwards, we can really start to recognize that in reality, it's the workers who make these places happen. Workers can run a, their workplace, whether or not the boss is there, 
whether or not the board is putting out a strategic plan. Um, we know how we know what needs to be done and how to do it, um, no matter what the pay scale is. Similarly, in housing complexes, you have a situation where landlords take a substantial amount of someone's income in order to not really do anything. In a lot of housing complexes, landlords will flat out refuse to make upgrades, fix things that are broken, um, or, or give people uh, relief in times of trouble. Evictions are, are have been up for, for years at a time when income, when people's health and their incomes are, are threatened by a pandemic. So organized tenants unions, like labor unions, can be a really powerful force when people stand together. In the places we work and in the places we live, there's a lot of opportunities to force fair treatment by building power together. And over time, that has to change something. And if it can't, or when it can't shift the balance of power in our individual or in our community lives, um, we recognize that People who believe similar things as we do need to be or ought to be in positions where they can make real decisions. Here I'm talking about electoral work. We're all living under established political systems that determine a lot of the decisions that make up our days. These can be very important or very mundane, where our food comes from, how we get around, our level of safety in the workplace, how waste is collected and, and disposed of, there are people in every level of government that are deciding how public money is collected and how it's spent for the, for the common good. Our whole project is to make sure that this project is more equitable than it is currently. Uh, we want to see socialist politicians that are um, deciding city, state, local budgets in order to provide for people, not hoard wealth or, or distribute it in ways that that result in the kind of inequality that we're living under. This is, of course, in opposition to the fact that there are people who are in office, are, are their campaigns are financed, basically because it's accepted that they'll try to keep things pretty similar to how they are now, pass the same budget, keep the current tax structure, just kind of hold steady. So while a lot of DSA members came into the movement, through the Bernie Sanders campaign, which of course was aiming for the presidency, the highest office there is, we also work every year sometimes to elect really cool, selfless, community-minded uh, city council members, county legislators, school board members, state representatives, all of this grassroots work to make sure from the bottom up there are people in office capable of making decisions that improve people's lives. Um, to circle back to labor, um, we would argue, I think, that an organized labor force needs the support of a committed and thoughtful government, but the site where the upper class can really be threatened with a loss of their power is in the workplace. So we support workers and unions and organizers, troublemakers of all kinds. We have together, you and I, Teresa, showed up to all types of picket lines where people were objecting to unacceptable workplace conditions. In fact, in 2020, when so many people were having to work through unsafe conditions during the pandemic with just kind of a nominal public acknowledgement of their status as valued essential workers. DSA worked with United Electrical, Radio, and Machine Workers of America to organize a nationwide emergency workplace organizing committee. This was a group that provided support and resources and strategy to anyone who got in touch saying, I'm working under conditions that I can no longer stand. What do I do? We've stood with our local Starbucks Workers United Union as they've suffered some really brutal, stressful, and, and uh, draconian repression in their workplace that's ongoing. And yes. we're not going to stop standing with them. Even today, some of us were out on a picket line with once again striking Starbucks workers mm -hmm. who have been told that all three, now the second and third Starbucks stores in Ithaca will be shut down. Um, I'll have to admit that I only reached the picket line as it was folding up for the day, but I saw a couple of comrades there. Mm -hmm. And showing up is important. No matter whether it's food service or healthcare, home care workers, teachers, 
hospitality workers, retail workers. If you have been thinking about trying to organize your workplace, there are resources available, not just through DSA, but other partner organizations will help you out. Um, we've talked on some of our other programs, which I recommend digging into the Ithaca DSA Presents archives. Um, we've talked about specific examples of how this has looked in other uh, countries, in other cities, municipalities, locally, um, at all levels, how democratic socialist projects are working to change people's lives. We underscore the promise of the Green New Deal, the possibility of a healthcare system that will, like, might work for everyone, similar to how you might see in Canada or England or other places that offer universal health care in some form or another. The idea that college can and should be a free resource and that trade schools and training should be more widely available. Even that parenting can and should be recognized as labor worthy of compensation. To say it again, we deserve an economy and a political culture that work for everyone, not just a few. And let's take it down to, to the ground level, to what goes on in Ithaca, New York. Ithaca Democratic Socialists of America is part of a national organization, Democratic Socialists of America. The chapter here began in October of 1978 as a chapter, or as it was called, a local of the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, at that time, I guess, a five-year-old organization. And a couple of years later, the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee at the national level merged with the New American Movement, um, which came more out of the New Left. And together, the two agreed to call themselves Democratic Socialists of America. So that was the beginning in 1981 of the current organization. And our chapter has survived all these years. Recently, national organizers advised the chapter that since it is quite small, it should pick one priority campaign and not try to prioritize everything. So the priority campaign the this year and last year is one called Free Cat. The idea being that public transportation buses in Tompkins County, TCAT in Tompkins County, should not charge riders fares. It's, it's not a crazy idea. I mean, this has been done in many other places. Yes. So, it's yeah, go ahead. Recognizing that transportation is a need for everyone. Um, when across the county, most people don't live in a place that is in walking distance from their workplace, from access to groceries, to social lives. So given that people live all over the county, um, there should be a resource that brings them to the places where they need to be. Um, it's, as you said, it has been done other places. So there are examples we can follow. And these aren't places you would expect it to be found. Um, it includes cities in places like North Carolina um, and Montana and Oklahoma, where people recognize that transportation is something that's needed by everyone. And, sh and can and should be provided to all, um, regardless of their ability to pay for it. That fares are not um, what allows for the operation of TCAT. It's a partnership between the city, the county, and Cornell that underwrites most of the budget. Well, actually, a lot of funding comes from the state also. And more could come from the state if with favorable state politics, I have not yet heard the details of the current state budget. Yes, so we have, as Teresa said, been organizing over the past year plus to try to persuade the people who are capable and we say obliged to make our local bus system free, that this is something that they should take as a step towards increasing mobility and increasing reliability of, of bus service throughout the county. And 
reducing emissions from loads of cars that currently take people almost everywhere they need to go. And for that matter, freeing the city, the city of acres of parking lots where if there weren't, if, if not so much transportation was done by private cars, we could build more housing. Yeah. An additional aspect I was thinking about just today is when I'm taking the bus, I don't feel like I'm in competition for space on the road. I'm like in a little tiny community traveling with other people instead of worrying about other drivers or thinking about what they're doing and, and how, you know, whether or not they're a threat to me. It's just a, a more peaceful way to get around. Yeah. And, oh, maybe we should mention, well, we're talking about buses that for which you don't have to pay each time you ride. And we're talking also about better buses, um, a better staffed system that would where buses would run on schedule and go to more places at more hours than is now the case. And I mentioned that it would be good if there was more state funding, but an obvious local source for funding would be, no, not our property taxes, but money from Cornell, which does not pay any property taxes. Well, I shouldn't say that because there are certain Cornell properties that do pay taxes, but most of the properties don't. And for instance, they account for half of the property in the city. In the city, There's an enormous accumulation of wealth there sitting up on East Hill. And I believe they contribute through this thing called the pilot program, the payment in lieu of taxes, which is right. a negotiation, which gives us a perfect opportunity to ask for some accountability, ask for some some reimbursement for the the fact that the local workforce is what keeps Cornell running. But well, this is our priority project, but we can't avoid other areas of struggle. You already mentioned two big ones, um, supporting unions, especially right now, Starbucks. I mean, the Starbucks union. We'll also probably be supporting the teachers union, if only through our votes in the upcoming school board elections. And you mentioned our electoral work. Sure. Electing the local candidates of the solidarity slate. Correct, yes. And this was something that came out of the fact that when it's, when it's election season, there's a lot of opportunities to volunteer. There's a high need for volunteers. And an organization like DSA um, is a great resource for local candidates to, to tap into if they're looking for people to make calls, knock on doors, collect donations, distribute literature. Um, so we have supported um, city, county, and state candidates, um, but it was recognized that there's kind of a need for this grassroots work to be, to, to, um, plant some seeds, recruit candidates, and ensure that the people that we're helping to elect to office are really connected to a movement, not just doing this for their own career, and that they're then accountable to local organizations who have an ear to the ground, know what the struggles are um, among the local working class, and are, are willing to work to ensure that they're not just getting a, a comfortable job in the government, but that they are really truly representing the people. So a couple of years ago, we worked to recruit candidates for this thing called the Solidarity Slate. It wasn't 
something born out of DSA, but we were partners with the Ithaca Tenants Union and now with the Working Families Party. Um, and it's only grown since then. So this year there are five candidates running for Ithaca City Council, all with the common goal of making this a better place to live for everyone. And we also do political education, as we refer to it. Um, some of it has been, well, we were calling it night schools. They were Zooms in the evening. But more of that sort of thing has now been done in person at a local bookstore. Um, yeah. our, our political education mm -hmm. programs are, are a good way for people to get involved, um, either if they're unfamiliar with um, what, what some of the topics are we're talking about, whether public housing or um, protecting the rights of immigrants and refugees. Um, the reading groups in the night schools have covered topics like international socialism, um, the Black Panthers, the Zapatistas, um, land back for indigenous peoples, the difference between leftists and liberals, um, the original writings of people like Marx or Rosa Luxemburg or, or other radicals throughout history. Um, so it's a good chance to get to know other people locally. And if you're interested even joining the political education committee and helping determine what public events take place, what readings we focus on, and how we can learn more about making a better world together. Yeah. For the theoretically inclined, there's the Marxist reading group. Reading. Well, first they were reading classical texts, and then I think they actually began to read modern Marxists. And of course, with discussion, that being the important part. Um, and well, you're listening to community radio and these radio programs also go on um, public access tele cable television. We were doing that actually historically long before there even was community radio in this city. And there are other areas where there are, you might say, the pe members of the chapter have maybe small working groups or individual efforts, housing, to some extent, cooperating with the Ithaca Tenants Union, and to some extent, advocating for better legislation, including maybe even public housing or cooperatives. Um, adv advocating, you know, for changes in the system. There are ecological socialists. I think you mentioned a few things, publicly owned power, uh, well, the whole Green New Deal. Yes, which we do have a local Green New Deal um, configuration that was passed, but it certainly needs some work and pressure ongoing over time to make sure that it uh, really stays true to ecological sustainable goals and uh, promotes equity in outcomes. Social justice. Correct, yes. Um, and then there is health care. Uh, the long drive to either at the national level get Medicare for all, as Bernie Sanders was pushing, or in New York State, a New York State version, the New York Health Act which, I mean, this New York State is as big as lots of countries that are on their own healthcare systems. So 
no reason why one couldn't do it at the state level. Yes, it's long overdue, and long since have we asked, answered the how are you, how can you pay for it question. We know how we can pay for it. We just need to get it in place. It costs less. That's the point, because there are, the money isn't wasted on duplicate bureaucracies and profits, you know, profiteering pharmaceutical companies, profiteering medical device companies. But most of all, just the administration is so much simpler. That's where the big savings are. That's where much of the savings are. Um, and then let's see, we also work, have on occasion been cooperatively working for immigrant rights, uh, joining anti-racist efforts, Black Lives Matter, the, the summer and fall and even winter of demonst demonstrations following the killing of George Floyd. Um, I guess we've touched on pretty much all the areas that at least Ithaca DSA has been excited about. Mm -hmm. And all of it we arrived at through conversations um, with other activists, with partner groups. Um, we're, we're all volunteer. All of us are doing this because it's something we're passionate about and because we care about the people around us. So it's a great group to get involved with if you're looking to engage in this thing called politics at the community level. And as for decisions at the national level, in the national organization, um, two of us will be delegates to the national convention in Chicago in August. And that's where some bigger national decisions will be made. So David Foote and I, both activists in Ithaca DSA, have been talking about what's been happening in the Ithaca DSA chapter. This has been Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm Teresa Alt. Thanks for watching. One, two, one, two, three.